Before we even accept the idea that affirmations are even the best way to do it, how about we use yeah. the technology for how our brains actually operate? We ask ourselves questions, we don't speak in affirmations that way. So it's not, I am good looking, I am 145 pounds, dropping 70 pounds from 215. It's like, the better way to do it, let's leave affirmations to the side. Instead, ask yourself questions because it's how your brain is built. Thank you for coming on the podcast, Todd. Yeah, I'm excited to do this. We're, we're driving, we're going right into it. Todd Herman, you guys. So he wrote a book called The Alter Ego Effect, The Power of Secret Identities to Transform Your Life. And you're basically, would you call yourself a performance coach? You help like hundreds of people, right? Through business C like CEOs, athletes, high performance of, yeah. of, in, in all areas, basically get to the levels that they want and like kind of succeed in the goal, get to their goals basically, if they have stumbling blocks or things that are so I was stopping a coach. them. I was a coach, Jen, when coaching wasn't a thing. I started my company in 1997, the peak athlete and um, grew it to the largest peak performance and mental game coaching company in the world. Sold it to Real Madrid in 2014. So work with Cristiano Ronaldo, Rafael Nadal, Kobe Bryant. I built out his Black Mamba um, alter ego and, and then built up other coaching and training companies along the way because the moment someone finds out that you work with Kobe or the likes of that, another leader goes, well, I got to perform at a high level. And so I took my peak performance strategies and took them into the leadership in corporate world and built a company and sold it to Chevron. Um, and so I've built three different coaching and training companies and sold them. But yes, I operate between the six inches of people's ears and give them better strategies, models and methods to help them actualize and bring out of themselves all of their capabilities. Wow. So let's just go back to the fact that you were you. I didn't realize that you were the first of its kind in the performance uh, Kind of the performance coach yeah. era because now everybody and their dog on their dog are claiming that they're you know high performance coaches yeah. and claiming that but you actually were the the man behind kobe bryant's alter ego yeah or so tell me about that well i'm a very big believer in mentorship and apprenticeship and so I'll go back a little bit. So when I started, yeah, coaching wasn't a thing. <laughs> All my friends teased mm -hmm. me and said, basically, I was unemployed and I was like just trying to find a job while I was calling myself a coach. And it well, that wasn't the case, but whatever. And and so I started in 97 working with young athletes on the mental game. It was one of my strengths when I played college football. I was a nationally ranked badminton player. And I just happened to fall into this world of like helping these young young people as well. How? How did you actually fall into it if it was yeah. if it wasn't even existing, right? So, so you didn't. Yes, to answer that, so then I was um, a, an assistant coach coaching the defensive backs at a high school in Sherwood Park, Alberta. I lived in Edmonton, Alberta at the time, and um, one of my former Love teammates it. from the University of Alberta, go Golden Bears. I know you're a Bison mm -hmm. girl. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and two Canadians. Two Canadians from the prairies here. Um, yeah. So. I was working with these defensive backs and I was spending more time with them. I'm like, listen, you don't need to run more cone drills. Like, like you're already in great shape. The reason you're making mistakes or the reason you're not getting the success that you want out there is, is really, you've got really bad preparation skills. You've bad, got, you know, bad rituals, bad routines. You're not setting good goals for yourself. So I kind of gave them my, my, my stuff, but I also taught them about how their brain worked because I fell down that rabbit hole many years before that. Now remember, I'm, I'm still young. I'm only 21 at the time. And these kids started getting really, really great results. One kid in particular went from a 29% uh, average in school to the honor roll in less than six months. And, and so and it was because of the whole me showing him kind of more about how the brain sort of worked and how his mind creates things, all this kind of stuff. So anyways, one of the moms came up to me and said, hey, I'd like to hire you to like mentor Kirby. And I said, yeah, love to. And she's like, okay. And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, well, how much do you want to charge me? And I said, oh, um, how about $75 for, for three sessions? So that was my price, Jen, from 97 until January of 2020. For almost three years, I charged 75 bucks for a package of three sessions in home visits with- Wait, wait, 2020 or, or 2000? Yeah, 2000, sorry, 2000. 
I'm like, Ooh. what do you mean? Are you no. how are you making a living? No, you know? sorry. That was two thousand. Sorry, two thousand. Uh, okay. So, so for three years, yeah. you were making seventy five dollars for three hours. Three sessions exactly in home. My my when okay. I did my taxes, I was averaging eight dollars and fifty six cents an hour. Uh, because gas money was my gas was the highest cost for me in my business but I say that so I was super cheap gave me a lot of reps I was full all the time and um, but I loved what I was doing I think like I mean I really I wasn't I was what I call an accidental entrepreneur at the time I fell into it accidentally that's what I mean by like I fell into it because it was because one mom asked me if I could mentor and so I was get I was good at it like I was a really good coach and then I was three years into it, end of 99, or two years into it, end of 99, and I, I was reading all these different psychology books and stuff, and this gets to the whole Kobe thing. This is uh, just to track this. This is really important setup for it. So I was reading all these psychology books and physiology books and kinesiology books and stuff about the mind and everything, um, and there's one book that resonated the most, and it was from this guy, Harvey Dorfman, who wrote the book Coaching the Mental Game, and I, he just, it's, everything just sounded practical. And he's known as the Yoda of baseball. He's the biggest mental game guy in professional baseball. All the professional teams wanted to work with him. So I cold called him. And uh, my, my voicemail I left him was basically, uh, hey Harvey, it's Todd Herman. We, we've never met before, but I have this little coaching practice in the mental game space, kind of like you, but I'm nowhere near you. And I know enough to know that I need someone like you in my world and no one else's stuff resonates. I'd love to maybe help you out if I could, you know, be an assistant for you. And then I gave him my number and he called me back about two days later. And he's like, you know, uh, we're talking and I said, well, I could come down to North Carolina because now this is the baseball off season. So this is December, end of December 99, it's the baseball off season. And uh, I said, well, I can come down to North Carolina and I can spend some time. And he's like, you don't want to live with me, kid, do you? And I was like, no, 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 I got an aunt and uncle who live in the area. I can stay with them. That was a lie. I didn't. I just wanted to, I just wanted to get to a yes as easily as possible. Yes. And so he agreed. And so I went down to North Carolina. I stayed at a Motel 6 for $28.50 a night, maxed out my Scotiabank Visa credit card, which had a $1,000 limit on it while I was down there. I ate um, Ichiban ramen um, soup. Ichiban? Yeah. <laughs> yes. And um, I brought it with me in my suitcase, and I had to pick up more when I was there, some cup of noodles and things like that. And uh, anyways, I spent 33 days with Harvey Dorfman. And um, on the eighth day, some of the biggest names in baseball started making their annual pilgrimage down to see him. And I got to sit in on these sessions with Roger Clemens, Andy Pettit, Craig Biggio, the biggest names in baseball at the time. And, who else? Who else? Keep on going. Uh, well, everyone else I wouldn't want to disclose because, I mean, there were private conversations with him, but those are the three that have, you know, mentioned at least uh, myself and Harvey in the past. But, Just tell me, was Derek Jeter there or they, that was Jeter, before his time? Jeter didn't come down. Yeah. Um, okay. But, uh, yeah, so I got to see the master of mental game work with the top athletes in the world, and it was just such an education for me. So at the end of the 33rd day, uh, Harvey, you know, we had, we're had kindred spirits now, and he started funneling pro clients my way. And now, fast forward three years, Kobe Bryant is going through the sexual assault trial in Denver, Colorado, and he's having a crisis of ego. He gets connected to Harvey. Harvey is talking to Kobe, and Kobe's um, talking about how he feels like he's losing his edge. And it was just before the uh, basketball training camp. NBA training camps. And Harvey said to him, you're not having, you're not losing your edge. You're having a crisis. You're going through an ego death. And um, a guy that I work with specializes in identity based performance. And you should talk to him. And so Harvey connected Kobe and I. And then through that process, we built the Black Mamba. Wow. First of all, that is unbelievable. Yeah. I, okay, so that in itself probably just catapulted your entire career. It was, um, yeah, it was one of those pinnacle moments um, that changed everything for me. And it was, it was more that, because I had just discovered this world of alter egos as, an identi as a performance tool about seven months before that, helping a, a U.S. Olympic swimmer get ready for the Athens Games. Um, and... 
it was common. Who was that? Who was that? Who was that? I actually don't share my private clients um, with people unless they mention me in public. That's the only time. And actually, I'll get to that in a second, uh, Jen, with this other interesting thing that happened as I was growing this um, performance coaching business. But anyway, so she had mentioned this performance identity, or she called it her alter ego. Other people talked about a persona that they would use and so forth. And I was like, wait a second. I did the exact same thing when I played sport. I had Geronimo that I took out onto the football field. Then when I was starting this fledgling business when I was young, I looked like I was 12, so insecure about how young I looked. I wasn't making sales calls. I was good at coaching. I wasn't good at building my business. So I built up this new alter ego, Super Richard, who was literally hired for me to do sales calls for my business. And that allowed me to like, you know, become more of myself, so to speak. So I was very familiar with using alter egos and I just fell knee deep into it and found that if you change people's identities, everything changes with it because habits, uh, beliefs, attitudes, behaviors are all stacked on top of how you see yourself and the identity that you have. And, um, and so that alter ego thing exploded and then even Tim Grover, um, who was Kobe's fitness coach and Michael Jordan's fitness coach as well, when, when we met at Sarah Blakely's, you know, the founder of Spanx, she did an event and brought myself and Tim Grover and Frank Shamrock, the great um, UFC fighter, in to speak. He came up to me when we were doing the, um, the sort of before evening drinks night and networking, and he gave me a big bear hug from behind, and he's like, damn it, Todd, I wish I was the one who came up with that alter ego stuff. Um, and <laughs> so anyways, it did, it catapulted, it made the alter ego stuff my signature thing and, um, got me into the ranks of the people that I've worked with. Can I say something yeah. actually? Um, that's a fat, that's a fantastic story. And I'm happy you mentioned Tim Grover because he's been kind of resting his laurels on this idea that he, he kind of, even though I know he, he was his personal trainer, fitness coach. Yeah. He says it in a very gray area where people I believe think that he was the his performance coach no. because his whole book about winners versus losers and the mindset and the mentality he's never ever said he was his trainer he he implies over and over again that he was you yeah. not you but like the performance part of it yeah and nobody ever corrects him yeah so he's built an entire business on this and you're just telling me that you're friends with him or you know him doesn't that bother you at all well he's definitely um, skirted the territory of, like you said, the, the gray area. I, I mean, I'll say this, like, I mean, how do you build mental toughness? I mean, you know this as being like a fitness superstar as well. Like mental toughness is something oh, that you earn. You. you don't learn it. You can't buy a book on mental toughness and be mentally tough. You need to go out and develop it through the things that you do. And so mm -hmm. can you, can you be de developing someone's mental toughness because you push them hard physically? Oh, a hundred percent you can, but the thing that um, people need to remember is I was explicitly always being hired to deal with the six inches between the brain. The inner game stuff is where I did. I didn't do anything with your physical game. I didn't teach you how to swing the glove club better. I didn't teach you how to swing the bat better. That was up for your skill-based coaches. I literally just stayed there. And it, what it allowed me to do was I ended up working in 82 different sports. And it was that ability to be between all these different sports it was how i discovered the whole alter ego thing because if you stayed nested inside of one um sport you would have never found it as this like amazing performance tool so it you know i don't know if it really bothers me because yeah it's it's gray zone i think for most people but again like i tell people is like i'm explicitly hired for mental game stuff yeah it bothers i mean to, if i was being honest yeah. i would say it bothers me because like his entire platform, oh, yeah. sorry, but this is the truth. You know what I mean? Like people don't know what they don't know, yeah. right? And so I live and breathe this every day with people coming on the podcast and in, my, and in my regular business life. So I know the difference. But if people don't know the difference, I think it's not, it's not cool, not fair yeah. to imply something when it's completely not true. You know what I mean? And, and, and build an entire business and speaking business and book business around this idea when you are the guy well you know what i mean like yeah. it's crazy jennifer that's my that's but that's the battle with how i show up on social media with people like i don't play well with influencers frankly because i'm a practitioner you know practitioners typically are not the most followed people um, influencers 
are the ones who, um, and again, I'm not branding all influencers, but people who only publish content and they're not in the gutters, they're not on the field, they're not in the, the muck and the grime of helping people every single day do difficult things. There is massive nuance that is lost in that. And so there's a lot of different ideas that are pandered around on social media from people who haven't done the work. Totally. Oh my God, you have no idea. You know, yeah, categorically I false. I'll give you a good one. What's the, one of the most popular terms that's out there today? Imposter syndrome. And I mean, I used to use it as a term in the last couple of years. But again, I've been doing this since 97. Imposter syndrome was never a word that was ever uttered until literally I did a post on social media. You can go and people can go and find it. And I showed the Google search algorithm from between 2004 to now. And you see the moment Instagram started in 2010, all of a sudden imposter syndrome searches started to go up and they were consistent every single month. Okay, well, that's interesting to me. First off, imposter oh. syndrome, when it was first coined as a term, was not syndrome. It was imposter phenomenon in the 1970s. Two women discovered it, and it was because more women were coming into the workforce, and they were feeling like they were not being very good at being a mom or a professional woman at the same time. They kind of felt like they were being imposters. All right? It's not a syndrome, but social media loves catchy little terms like that, and now people think that it's an actual thing, and it is not. Imposter can be coupled down to three basic things. One, you're actually terrible at what you do right now. You're just bad. It's not an imposter, you're just new. You're a beginner, like you gotta get better. Suck it up, like sorry, there's no other way to say it. You gotta do the reps, you gotta do the thing. Secondly, being an imposter could be that you're just fucking lying. You're lying about who and what you can do. Well, good, now carry the badge of being an imposter because congratulations, you are one. You are one. So, but that isn't most people. That's an extraordinarily small group of people that would be that. And the third one is people who feel like they're an imposter despite the fact that they have the skills, they have the abilities, they have the qualifications to go out and do something, and they are scared of being found out. No, what that is is a lack of confidence. You're not leaning into the reps and the things that you've done over the course of your lifetime that qualify you to do this thing. And those are the people that I like to help. That is, I, I could, first of all, I could not agree with you more. Maybe it's because it's a Canadian, both of us. <laughs> um, uh, but I have a huge problem, a huge problem with how things have kind of evolved and morphed with social media, right? Because people are selling all these courses and claiming, like I said to you at the beginning of this podcast, to be, you know, these um, high performance coaches who can, who can make you, who, who can get you to a place where you can make, you know, yeah millions of dollars and buy your planes and like or they can tell themselves as the person who did whatever but they're not in the trenches it's all smoke and mirrors and you can get away with anything because there's always a sucker born every day mm -hmm. and and people just don't know besides being a sucker some of them are and some of them just don't know what they don't know and so yeah. With all, with all the information overload you wouldn't know like some of these people are so slick and so good that like unfortunately like you can get away with a lot of stuff yeah. and so the real the people who are the real like the meat on the bone they're not the greatest social media no. influencers right because they're actually out doing the work yeah. they don't have time to be content creating all day that's right do you know what i mean Nailed it. Nailed the, it. 100%. It, that's what it is because the truth of the matter is what you're seeing on social media are great content creators yeah. and great internet marketers those are not the same as being somebody who, who is a real performance coach, period. Or, or, you know, like even to take it in a different direction of someone who's trying to um, help you develop your online business, say, for example. Okay. Okay. So take it in that yeah. direction. Um, the, here's an easy way to qualify whether someone is going to have meat on the bone. Do they work with people one on one? So that means, do they have a marketing agency where they execute the work? Because you can hide a lot of stuff in the way that you show up on social media by just having great little sound bites, great little, but the moment you start asking more clarifying questions with someone, boom, you've just poked through the very thin exterior of what they have as skill set or understanding on the topic. Like there is no one on the planet. I mean, I own the category of alter egos. 
Like, I mean, when someone- Do you like, really? Oh, 100%, everywhere around the globe. I get tech, when someone starts talking about alter egos on LinkedIn or Instagram or you name it, I'll typically be tagged right away and saying, oh my God, have you read Todd Herman's book? Or when someone starts posturing with expertise on the topic, someone says, uh, yeah, I like it the first time I read it in Todd Herman's book, Alter Ego Effect. You literally just pulled out chapter number three from his book. So that's a powerful thing. But if even someone is talking about alter egos, I can ask them just a couple of questions immediately and I'll know whether or not they even understand the science behind why this thing works so well. But again, that's I, amazing. I've coached that's amazing. thousands of people on this. Like I know it at my bone. And, and so, and by the way, it's not that I'm, th there is a very good use for people who are influencers and stuff because sometimes they can make people aware of something, right? Their job is mm -hmm. to build awareness, but now it's gone to the level, which is kind of our sources of consternation with it, is people think that because they talk about something a lot, that they're an expert on it and that's the problem. And they're not. Exactly. And they say it over and over again. Well, you know what's interesting though? If you own the terminology, right? Alter ego. Why? And you've been doing this since 1997. Why is the book just, why would, why did you write it in 2019 and not in 2005, 2002, Great 2010? Question. Great question. It's because I owned a coaching and training company. You know, it was at the very mm -hmm. centerpiece of how people came into my world. And so I knew that there would be Tim Grovers out there who would want to get their hands on it because it was my IP. Again, mm. this gets back to like understanding what business models are. And I have a coaching and training business model. This is long before social media. So I always knew that, I, I mean, I had people asking me in 2004 and five, can you write this, can you write a book on it? And I was like, yeah, I will, I will. But I also, I wanted to understand it even better too, right? Like I didn't know everything about well, what was the science behind this? Because that was always our background for my peak performance company was we are going to explain this stuff with neuroscience and science as to why these things work. So I waited until uh, we started it in 2016 and it came out in 2019, mm -hmm. but it was because I had sold my company. I didn't need it and needed to own the training idea on it. And it was sort of my way of, you know, birthing it onto the world to get the concept into wider circulation. So that was the biggest reason why I never wrote it early enough or earlier. So what's so, what's so interesting, like this is fascinating because I wasn't even expecting to talk to you about all this stuff. I'm glad in a way that my algorithm didn't pick up on certain <laughs> interviews that you did because now I'm learning this piece about you, which is I think actually very, very fascinating and interesting. I'm still on this idea though, like how did you, you don't have a psychology degree, right? No. You don't have a background in psychology. Besides fall, like training and, and kind of shadowing uh, Dorfman, the, ba the baseball coach or baseball yeah. performance coach, besides that type of on pr kind of experiential pr uh, training, how did you figure out how to do this well? Like, what, how did you know what to do? You know, were you just naturally gifted in this area or? Well, okay, so when I started in 1997. Right. Yeah, I had, and the mom asked you to mentor. Yeah, I mean, I was I was insecure with, um, yeah, my understanding of what I was doing because it was again it was accidental. But now I'm like, okay, well now I need to actually coach these young kids with some sort of method. So I put together my ideas, and it, again, there was no internet. There wasn't internet. Right. It wasn't widely used. Right. So I was in the Edmonton Public Library all the time. I was listening to Dennis Waitley books on tape, um, who was a performance guy at the time, and like many others. So I was trying to piece certain things together. And, but I was coaching. I didn't have a training company at the time. I wasn't doing workshops. I was just doing one-on-one -on -one coaching. But over all those reps, I immediately started to see what resonates, what works, what doesn't work. Um, and again, I was an insatiable uh, researcher, researched tons of different content as well that started to put this all together and but i didn't like, I did. like tony robbins or wayne dyer and, yeah or... um tony yes one of my earliest mentors before even um harvey was jim Rohn. Uh, i met him randomly yeah. at an event and um, my uncle was getting construction person of the year in canada i was really close with my uncle ted and so i came with him to banff mm -hmm. alberta um, and I sat next to Jim Rohn, who I didn't know yet. And he was asking me all these questions that, you know, adults didn't ask me. 
and um, like what I wanted to do with my life, what's my vision for things. I'm like, like this guy's amazing, He's, <laughs> you know, letting me talk. And um, yeah. and then he goes up and gives one of the greatest keynotes I'd ever heard in his way. If people aren't familiar with Jim Rohn. He's just an absolute legend in speaking. He's a legend. legend. Yeah. And uh, came back to the table and I said, well, I want to do that, what you just did. And he gave me a couple of things to do and I did them. It was a, that was a Saturday. On the Monday at one o'clock in the afternoon, I was done the three things that he gave me to do and I called him back. He called me back the next day and said, you're officially the only person that's ever, you know, taken me up on my challenge. And he started like helping me out, um, figure things wait, out. Wait, wait, what was the challenge? You can't just leave me hanging. Well, what the three was the things challenge? Because I said what I wanted to go do. And he okay. said, okay, well, first thing you need to do is you need to go and um, register a business name for yourself. Where do you do that? And I said, I don't know, but I can figure it. I think you go to the um, city hall in Edmonton, which was wrong. You don't go to city hall. You go to a government, uh, this other government uh, division. So that, um, and then take that, and then you can go and open a bank account, get, get your bank account opened. And then um, can you call at least three people to try and book yourself some sort of speaking gig? And I said, yeah, I, can, I know who the two people are that I could call. And um, at one o'clock, I had done all of that. I had, so I went and registered, got an Alberta limited num numbered company. And then I went to um, Scotiabank and I got my uh, bank account. And then I called Eric and I called um, this other guy, Richard, who both ran sports associations. And I booked myself a little speaking gig and or two speaking gigs. And that was and that was it. And I had a topic. He said, you also have a topic. And so my topic was the triune athlete, the mentally, emotionally, and physically tough athlete. And when you align all three of those, you get all of someone's capabilities on that ice. Because I was going after hockey players at the time. So that's how it started. And then I did so well with those two speaking gigs that I was like, wait a second, I have no idea how to grow a business. I only know how to do one thing, and that's speak. And the reason I knew how to speak was because I was in 4-H. Um, so 4-H, if people aren't familiar, is like agricultural Boy Scouts. It's one of the things that you do while you're in a 4-H club is you have to do um, a speaking competition every year with your club. And if you win that, then you advance and you advance. And so I actually won the speaking competition when I was 10 and you know did it again when I was 11, 12. I did it until I was 16. So I was very comfortable being on stages. And that was, that was my marketing channel. I only did speeches and I did I, I wanted to resolve that this was actually a business that was a real thing because there was no such, like I said, there was no such thing as coaches. So how can I validate this thing? Am I going to just waste my time doing something that no one's going to pay me for in the future? So I said, well, let there were some, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. there were some coaches. There was Dorfman, you said. There was that guy, Dennis, that you yeah. researched but, a little but bit. But that was at the pro level. Yeah. But there, okay. it wasn't an industry yet at the amateur level. Right. There was not. Yes. Yeah. And so that was the big thing. Um, so I said, okay, well, let's just see how many speeches I can do in the next 90 days. And if nothing comes of it, whatever, I'll just move on to something else. So I ended up doing 68 free speeches in 90 days. And um, that was in 97 going into 98. Or it was really by then it was 98. And I basically never had to market my business since because I had a waiting list. And everyone in my province of Alberta knew who this guy was. Or you're one degree away from knowing me. And that was it. Wow. Yeah. So wait, so I want to know, so like, what would I, okay, so let's say I'm a person who comes to you. What's the first thing we do? Like, if I have a goal in mind, if I have to, if I, if I, if I have a, something that I'm trying to achieve and I, yeah. I, and I'm blocked, what do you tell, what's the first thing that you do in your, in your module? Well, are you talking about back then or now? <laughs> because it's very two different worlds. Both. I, I, I'm telling both. Like, how did you start and where, where, how you started and where you ended up? So it like, all started with a diagnostic and it still does. So I have certain diagnostics that I get people to take. In the sports world, I grade you on seven different pillars of uh, mental, uh, mental toughness. And or you're really grading yourself on it. And of those seven, there's one in there that's an outlier one. I call it the red herring, that if you rank yourself low on it, I don't work with you, and it's motivation. It's the one thing that I cannot control. The other six I can give you skills on. Motivation is a you thing, not a me thing. I've stood on stage and said that. Like I, I love that. Because if you're not motivated, if you don't have a drive to pick up the racket and go hit balls at the wall until they bleed, I can't help you. Like I can't build the other things like visualization and imagery skills, bringing, building out what I call the holographic mental movie theater in your head. I built it out for Kobe Bryant. 
um, for him to go into and do what he called communing with his black mamba. So for him, there was a cage that was built and uh, the black mamba lived in the cage. And what many people would do is you would think about going into, the, going into your mind and uh, releasing the cage to allow the thing to come out. Kobe was a bit different. He went into the cage, closed the door behind him, and he became the black mamba that way. So it's just like little nuances. So that's one, like building your mental movie theater. Um, another one is just confidence. Another one is going to be anxiety and stress management. Another one is going to be your concentration and focus skills. So we do diagnostics. So, I mean, I work with entrepreneurs just like you. I work with CEOs. I work with teams of CEOs or teams um, from a company or, you know, sports teams and, and, and athletes, right? But it always starts with diagnostic because everything should be customized to you. You're a unique being, Jen. Like, I, I say that there's no such thing as special snowflakes. I don't like special snowflakes. I don't want everyone dancing around, arguing for their limitations, arguing for their excuses. I work with elite human beings that are striving to do ambitious things that's going to be very hard, and you're going to be running up against the uh, vision of what you think your identity can solve. That's who I work with. And so, Okay, you said... Yeah. This is so great. Sorry. I, don't, I, don't, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Finish your thought, and I'll tell you after. Yeah, and so, so when we're working with people, like I have another company, 90 Day Year, which is a performance system that's born out of our sports performance world that helps business owners grow and scale their business without getting burnt out. So even in that one, we always start with, it's <laughs> Simon Sinek says starts with why. That's how I know Simon Sinek has never worked with anybody, okay? He's an I influencer think, uh, as well. I, and it's you, not, you would be, you would be, yeah. I see you, I see you. <laughs> yeah, but this is, but everyone who does this stuff for a living, Jennifer, has the exact same response. I did a keynote speech at Traffic and Conversion Summit, one of the biggest um, online or digital marketing events, about 12,000 people. I did a keynote on basically saying starts with why is just, you know, it's cotton candy, it's popsicles, it's bubble gum. You know, it sounds great, but it's less filling. You know, it tastes sweet. That's how I know an idea typically isn't a good idea and will break under the weight of practical application because it just sounds like cotton candy to me. It's not starts with why. With anybody, if, if you're someone who coaches someone, that's listening. It's always, it starts with where that individual is. It's not starts with why, it's like, I need to know, are you in Detroit or are you in Chicago before I give you the pathway? I don't need to, why is in the process, but it's not starting with it, it's always starting with where is this human being? That's a diagnostic approach. The doctor does it when you come into the, like, oh, so why are you bleeding from the neck? Hey, like, <laughs> it's, hey, there is a, <laughs> freaking gash in my neck. That's the wear part of it. And now can we fix it? And then afterwards we can talk about why it happened so we can prevent it from happening again. Uh, can I just interject yet again? Yeah. I love how like honest you are on this podcast because I cannot tell you how many people are just not that way, right? Like they skirt around things. They try to be yeah. very politically correct and the PC and not say shit. That is so clear to me what it is yeah I, I i really appreciate you right now more than you know that's the first thing i want to say thanks Jen. um the, no you're welcome uh the second thing i want to say is you said something about confidence earlier in the diagnostic and concentration and focus yeah um i see a lot also with people talking about how to build confidence how to build confidence and you know what you said, we, we, we kind of talked about this at the beginning of the podcast was every, the confidence I believe, and it sounds like you do too, is that those things have to be earned. You can't just externally have someone tell you, you get confidence by just do A, B, and C. It's all about like, you have to get it from within, from things that you've accomplished on your own that you've earned. And besides that, I mean, it's virtually impossible if it's, if it's real true confidence. When you do your diagnostic, A, what are you looking at and how do you help people build that extra, that, that confidence that they do need to kind of go out there and, you know, crush? Yeah, so um, even going back to when we were talking about the concept of imposter syndrome and that third category of people who, they actually do have skills, competencies, they've, got, they've had wins in their life. And Jen, when you take a look at how most people lead their lives, it's, because our brain is wired um, as a precognition machine to find threats in the world, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. I'm walking out of the cave and the bush over there is rustling. Holy shit, it's a saber-toothed tiger. Oh no, wait, it's a bunny rabbit. 
Most people in our world are walking around scared of bunny rabbits, and they don't go and investigate the bush over there. That's an important thing, because our brain is wired to pick up negative things. Like if something throw your Jennifer, the way that you lead your life, you're going to be doing so many things where you're stacking up, you know, confidence in other people. Your, your sort of reason that you exist, even for this podcast, is to try to give people better ideas, more uplifting ideas, encouraging people to continue to march forward through the bogs, the buyers, the, you know, the, the swamps and the difficult things that are laying ahead of them, but just to not quit because there's an amazing version of yourself waiting on the other side of that. And, and so, but, if one person in your day leaves a comment on your Instagram saying, oh, why, why did Jennifer, why did she change her haircut? Like, what's, what's up with that? And why does she wear like hoodies? Or why does she wear a sweatshirt? Like, she, you know, like, I'm not gonna listen to someone who's just got a hoodie on or a sweatshirt. Like, that's the one that like eats away at us. It's like that one little negative comment, the little thorn in our side, right? And it's, okay, totally. that's natural. I say this because I'm gonna lift this up. People that are listening to the podcast aren't gonna, aren't gonna see this, but I keep this stacked on my, on my desk. And these are all, it's a glass jar with a bunch of poker chips in it, okay? So I talk about how important it is for everybody to stack confidence chips in their day. You and I, we, we're all coming to the table, uh, the poker table of life. And if you're sitting there, Jen, with a huge stack of poker chips in front of you, and I've got a small stack, of course you're going to play bigger. You might be leaning back in your chair a little bit more, and you're going to be playing a little bit more relaxed. You might lose a hand and, ah, whatever, right? Whereas me, I've got this small stack, I'm gonna protect it. I'm, I'm even have a great hand with me. It's got, I got great cards, but oh, I can't afford to lose, and so then I don't go big. A lot of people play life that way. But why is that? It's because they haven't recorded their wins. So I met um, the CEO of Levi's, and he told me the story of when they were gonna be going into China. They're going into China, and he was, I'm not going to say terrified, but he was extremely nervous and anxious about their move into China. He didn't think it was going to go well. And he was avoiding doing and making some decisions. And he has this little journal that he keeps on his desk, and he has it broken up into three-year increments in his entire life. Zero to two, two to five, on and on through. And at each increment of three years, he has all of the things that he learned, all the wins that he developed, all the skills that he built and stuff stacked in between. And he picked it up, leafed through it, this mountain of information, this mountain of wins and skills. And he says, I couldn't help but feel like no matter what gets thrown my way, because something will, I'll be able to handle it, handle it. Because I literally have a journal that tells me that I have handled it. So how do I build people's confidence? First thing is, I'd love it if everyone that's listening to this took out a piece of paper, a journal or whatever, and you record all the wins that you've developed over your life. Stack the confidence chips in front of you so that when you're playing at the poker table of life, you can look down and say, yeah, that thing might be big, might be scary, might be risky, but look at my entire history tells me that I overcome. I'm resilient, I'm persistent. That sounds good. And then, and then you, and then how about the concentration piece and the focus piece? How can you help harness and develop that for people? Because I know people like me anyway, like yeah. I'm, I become my, my own worst enemy. It's hard for me to sit and concentrate long enough sometimes to get something done. And that's a lot of people, not because yeah. they don't have the, even the capabilities or the confidence, it's because they don't have the concentration. Skills. So, yeah. I mean, think about Jen, especially in the way that we grew up and schools have changed slightly, but they're still pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. We've got, uh, like I'm, and I'm not a big label person. I am dyslexic, diagnosed when I was uh, 21 after a car accident, which would have been very helpful to know that I was dyslexic while I was actually in school. <laughs> um, you found out afterwards. After, yeah. I'm like, well, no wonder it takes me freaking three days to read like 100 pages inside of a book. <gasps> Oh, you have no idea how long this took me to read this book. Oh. You don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry about that. Um, and then and diagnosed kidding. ADHD as well. But whatever, that's just useful. Now I can look at myself and go, okay, well, how does someone who has a certain energetic rhythm to how, they, how their body works, how their brain works, how can I best use that so that I can be focused and, concent and concentrate better? So for example, this goes back to the individual. When, when I'm working, like I'm standing right now, if I'm sitting down, I'm gonna fidget and all these things, that doesn't bother me. 
but I have a, um, a treadmill, small little standing treadmill. It's flat. That's right underneath my standing desk. I can pull it out and I walk and I work, right? Um, my point about that is that so many ways that people think about focusing and concentrating is about sitting, you know, in a mudra pose, you know, arms crossed, like meditation is only that way. That's not meditation. Like there's so many other ways that we can meditate or focus or concentrate that don't look like the typical way that, again, society and influence and people like that put out there as this is the way that we focus and we concentrate. That's, that's not it at all. So going back to the person, I'm just looking at how they, how, how they operate, how they work, and then I'm going to custom build them the method. Now I have, because I've had thousands and thousands of reps, everyone sort of gets into a bucket of how they work. So how do we actually practically teach someone to focus? Well, focus comes from the frontal lobe area. That's where, that's where the focusing skill needs to get built. So it's a muscle, so habits and hustle. I'm gonna get you to hustle on a certain set of habits or routines to build this thing up. One of them was getting someone to stare at a candle for about three minutes, okay, a flickering candle. I don't care if you're seated, I don't care if you're walking with it and it's got a glass thing around it, I don't care. I don't care how you do it, but you're gonna stare at that candle flickering for three minutes. You're gonna set a timer and you're gonna go. This is important because athletes are competitive, okay? Entrepreneurs, typically competitive as well, so it worked well. Set a timer for three minutes. Every time you find your mind wandering off of the flame and onto, you catch yourself in a thought, count to one. Then go back to staring at that candle flickering again. And then the moment you find yourself wandering, two, go back, three. And then when the timer goes off three minutes, record that number, all right? Now we've got a score. And then the next time you do it, tomorrow or whatever, see if you can improve that score. What we need is feedback loops. That's what I want to do with all of my training and my coaching and the stuff that I deliver with people is I want to help create a feedback loop so you can see growth happening with people. Okay. Um, it's funny. That's because, a great one. I like that. Yeah, I'm going to try that. In, in, the, um, in the National Hockey League, the equipment trainers in the National Hockey League know when a player is working with me one-on-one -on -one because I get the player while they're traveling. I want their gloves their stick and their helmet brought up to their hotel room. Because unlike other people who talk about visualization, you know, find a nice, calm, restful place beside the fireplace and, you know, calmly sit, you know, legs crossed. No, that is not how you need to visualize it. And you've got to close your eyes. It's actually categorically one of the um, worst things that you can do when you're learning to develop your visual brain. Because 70% of your brain is dedicated to the visual cortex, Jen. Closing your eyes now shuts off 70% of your brain. And so what happens? The other 30% lights up. And then you wonder why oh, meditation doesn't work for me because my, my brain just starts thinking about a million different thoughts. I feel like my, I climb into a race car all of a sudden and my brain is racing everywhere. And I'm like, yeah, that's because biologically you've set up yourself to fail at this. Secondly, most people when they're trying to visualize something, they make it difficult on themselves because they don't use props. Going back to the hockey player, the reason I want their stick, their gloves, and their helmet is I want to use what's called enclosed cognition. Enclosed cognition is the ph phenomena inside the human mind where you and I, we tell stories about articles, clothing, totems, artifacts. And the moment you put on that artifact, you actually adopt the traits of that thing naturally. You don't have to fake it, nothing. So if you put on a doctor's coat, Jennifer, because we already know what doctors mean, they're successful, they're detailed, they're methodical, they're smart, all these things. If you were doing a task that involved detail, methodical, um, and needing to be smart, you would actually unpack the traits naturally. Kellogg School of Management did a study on it, many others. My point is, it when you is that like the Batman effect? That's the Batman effect, cape? yeah. So the lady at University of Minnesota who did that study, um, what I heard was someone else who saw me doing a workshop in the early 2010s, let her know about this whole alter ego guy. Um, and so she did the study with young children. So just to close the loop for the listener, the Batman effect, at the university, they brought in a bunch of six, seven, and eight-year-olds into a room. And they had this puzzle set up. It had a bunch of locks on it. And they gave the kids keys to unlock the locks. 
Only problem is, is the keys didn't work in any of the locks. And they wanted to see their resilience, test their resiliency. So the kids come in individually, they try to unlock these things and they record the results. Next, they bring in a second group and they also rolled in a rack of Batman costumes and Door of the Explorer costumes. And they said, hey, pick your favorite costume, put it on, we got a little uh, challenge for you. So they put on the costume, they give them the keys, try to unlock all these locks, we're gonna time you to see how fast you can do it. The fascinating thing that they weren't expecting was the vocalized self-talk of these kids. The ones who were doing it just in their regular clothes would say things like, I'm not good at puzzles, this is too hard, I can't get this, I quit. The people who were wearing Door the Explorer or Batman costumes would say things like, well, Batman would never quit, so I'm not gonna put, quit. Door the Explorer always finds a way, so I'm gonna find a way. They had adopted the traits, qualities, attributes of the alter ego that they were wearing. So it's amazing. The, the question I have people is, okay, well then, who was being authentic in that moment? Because everyone loves to talk about authentic self and authenticity nowadays. That that's another big hashtag right yeah, now. Big time. And here's what I tell people. There's no such thing because there's no such thing as a self. There is no one Jennifer. There are many versions of you that show up. There's Jennifer the mom. There's Jennifer the podcast host. There's Jennifer the coach, the content creator. There's Jennifer the CEO of the company. There's Jennifer the speaker who gets on stages. There's Jennifer the author. There's Jennifer the citizen who goes out into the world and tries to spread light and be kind to other people and strike up a conversation with, this, uh, with the um, Starbucks uh, barista and things like that, right? There's many versions of you that operate in the world. There's no one authentic version of you sitting at your core. But what does sit at the core of every human being is a whole set of traits, abilities, qualities that we, with our creative imagination, can tap into. And so those kids that were wearing Batman costumes, they tapped into a version of themselves that was resilient and tough and wouldn't quit. They saw themselves differently. And when you see yourself differently, you now give yourself the permission to do things differently. The kids that were just sitting there in their plain clothes, they just retracted into whatever belief idea they have with, I'm not good at puzzles. This is too hard. I'm getting judged. The kids who were getting, the other Batman and Dora the Explorer kids, they were getting, quote, judged. But there was a mask between them and the judgment. The judger was judging Batman and Dora the Explorer, not that sort of innocent version of me on the inside. And that's just a part of like why the alter ego stuff just works so powerfully for people. I love it. I, I, I really, I believe in it. I think it's fast, like fascinating. And like, I had no idea that you were the man behind it, but um, <laughs> I've got, so I haven't even gotten to any of my real questions because I've just been so enthralled with all this other stuff. But um, what I wanted to ask you about it, because I, we're, you were talking about um, visualization, and yeah. I want to talk to you about affirmations. Another a huge, another huge thing that all I see about, like, yeah. and I get like I get lambasted. Is that even a word? Because I don't personally. I'm not a big person who who's much into ma the whole manifestation and affirmation mm -hmm. thing. And so whenever I say that, people are like. How can that, you don't know what it means just because you're not understanding what it is and da, 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 da. So when I read about what you said about affirmations, I really had to yeah. bring it up and I want you to explain yeah. and back it by research and science, what your belief system and what about affirmations and are they, are affirmations, um, do they work? Um, what is the science back? data on it. So what your science Todd says about Berman. affirmations. Well, first off, I'll say this and what what you struggle with, Jen, and what all of us will struggle with is when people create absolutes in the world where like, nope, affirmations can only be good. Right? Well, here's the problem <gasps> is we live in a world and nature is the greatest test of whether a model even exists. So nothing in nature is good or bad. Right? Like a forest fire can clean out the brush and bring back life. But it can also be terribly bad because it rages on because of poor forest management or something like that. Water. Last thing I want when I'm floating in the middle of the ocean is more salt water. Right? So there's hyper and hypo versions of something. Affirmations is a great example. When I see people like they're sitting on the pulpit of affirmations is the only way, it's the best way, it's like, okay, well, wait a second. Here's what the science says. 
The science says, University of Waterloo did a study on this, King's College in London did a study on this, uh, Neuroscience Research Lab at Stanford has done, tons of universities and colleges have done studies on this. And here's what we find. When people affirm something to themselves with an affirmation, where they actually don't have confidence in it and they don't believe it to be true, it actually causes depression and a depressive state. Depressive state possibly going into depression. That's what the studies show. So no, it is not a one size fit, fits all, like everyone should be touting affirmations to themselves. Like my, my mentor Jim Rohn would say, you know what would be a better affirmation for yourself is, I am broke, I live in America, and I have the skills to change but I'm not. Like, be honest with yourself. <laughs> be honest with yourself that way. But where affirmations do work, Jen, is when you do have confidence or you do have traction in something, reaffirming it with a positive affirmation does help to strengthen confidence with someone, right? So like, even you, like you coming on, you've had hundreds of reps at being an interviewer. like. I'm sure your natural self-talk isn't when you're coming on to do um, an interview, oh my God, Matthew McConaughey, like, I have no idea what I'm gonna ask. And it might, like, you know, it might've been cool to interview Matthew and stuff, but you're not gonna lose your interviewing skills. Your natural self-talk probably in your head is like, no, I'm good at this, I love it. Like, you're-, you're I you're can do it. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna reaffirm it. So no, affirmations are not the uh, one size fits all magical elixir to like success in life. It's obtuse to think it. So basically when this whole ideology of looking in the mirror and being like, you know, you got this girl or, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you look great, you know, your body's, you know, your body positivity when, when really you don't feel that way, right? Yeah. And, and you keep on telling yourself how, how beautiful you, you, you are. And how, I'm just giving a, this yeah. is a very simplistic yeah. example. What does that do? Does that make you feel worse, worse. about yourself physically? Yeah. 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 Because you really worse. don't believe it to be true. Yeah, because that other voice in your head that says, but, but I'm not that. Like but you, what if you are and you don't believe it? And so like, let's say for example, like, you know, you are somebody who, you know, you, you, you have it going on but you just have insecurity and low self-esteem. And so you really are it, even though you don't think it. By you doing an affirmation, does it help then? Okay, so, um, well, let's go back and say, before we Not to trip you up or anything. Yeah, no, no, I'm, we're not. I was gonna say, before we even accept the idea that affirmations are even the best way to do it, how about we use yeah. the technology for how our brains actually operate? Because okay. we are, always, Jen, if, if you and I um, are gonna be meeting at some sort of event, right? I'm already sitting in there. You walk in the door. What do you think is gonna be one of the first things that you're, you're gonna start saying to yourself? So you walk into the room. Uh, yeah. What are you gonna, what are you gonna- And I you, see you, I wonder where Todd is. There you go. You know, looking you for it. you. You did oh. it. I wonder where. You asked yourself a question. We ask ourselves questions. We don't speak in affirmations that way. So going back to, so it's not, I am good looking. I am, you know, 145 pounds, dropping 70 pounds from 215. It's like, the better way to do it, let's leave affirmations to the side. Instead, ask yourself questions because it's how your brain is built. Your brain is constantly trying to answer questions. So why? Why am I going, why am I going to be 115 pounds or why am I presently? What is it about me that makes me so kind and determined? Ask yourself questions so that your brain can give you answers. That's the way that we should be, instead of like affirming and making statements to ourselves as if we even think that that's the right statement. It's the ego coming in saying, no, I've got the perfect affirmation I'm going to say. No, instead, what if you just use this phenomenal processing power of our brain to give you answers back and instead you say to yourself, what is it about me that makes me so equipped to be an entrepreneur? Instead of saying, I'm a successful entrepreneur. No, what is it about me that makes me so equipped to be an entrepreneur? And then you write that down. No, look for like proof from your own life. Your brain will give it to you. 
So don't speak in That's affirmations. Really, yeah. Speak in positive questioning for yourself instead. That's a great, I like that so much. That's a, that's, I like that. That's very well, helpful. Again, it maps, it just maps back to, that's how our brain works. Like, you know, you walk into the event, you're like, oh, I wonder where Todd is. Um, oh, is there, yeah. anyone, is there anyone else here that I know? Um, oh, where's the open seats? Um, you know, are there, where right, are the cool exactly. people? Where are the what people? Where are the, <laughs> where's the, where's the stage? Where's the exit? Where's the entrance? You're like, hey, I like, I want to be on an end seat. Where is there an open end seat? Because I want to be able to get up and go to the bathroom or I like to get up and stand around or I like to go and lean against the wall. I don't want to be in the middle. 100%. Question, 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 question. That's how our brain operates. So if you're going to do it deliberately with yourself, which is what kind of the root of affirmations are, why don't we use deliberate questions to get us to where we want to go? That's great. Um, how, okay, let's talk about alter ego since that's really, I mean, like I said, I didn't even get to say my questions, but <laughs> I do believe, I, I do believe it is so uh, powerful. I talk about it, of course, in my book, as you know, yeah. um, and I want to know, so how do people actually create their alter ego? Let's start from the beginning. We know yeah. it's effective. Can you talk about why it's so effective, the, the research behind what makes having an alter ego so effective and what is it effect and what um, is it the most effect effectful for? Like <laughs> what is it? For? Is that yeah. a word? Yeah. <laughs> effect, yeah, effective for. Yes, so, thank you. Yeah, so we'll talk about like the situations that typically people will lean into developing an alter ego for in a second. Right. So some That's of the exactly like it. reasons why it's it's so effective is well one it uses the power of intentional disassociation. Um, you know, we're storytelling beings. No, no matter however much we want to think that we're so data-driven and we're such great decision makers, we, we create stories in our head. We add meaning to everything. And because mm -hmm. of that, a lot of people tell themselves narratives and stories about who they are, what they're capable of, uh, what they're worthy of that isn't very supportive and then it gets in the way of them taking the actions that they want to take. So the alter ego um, or personified self or secret identity disassociates from my current narrative and allows me to attach itself to a new idea of what I think I am. So Kobe Bryant did that with the Black Mamba. Um, Beyonce, like I talk about in the book, Beyonce grew up in a gospel singing family in a very religious family. She stood at the front of her church every Sunday. People would come to watch her and her sister sing. And so here she is singing a lot of those types of songs. And now her father puts her into uh, essentially a dance pop troupe of eight, other, of eight girls total, seven others from her. And now she's dancing provocatively and singing provocative or pop lyrics on stage. That was a very out of body experience for her. She felt it just was very challenging to her. And so when you look at why she created Sasha Fierce, it's because the fierce word was actually on the opposite end of the spectrum from what she was feeling like, which was, you know, trepidation or scared or, you know, this isn't me. She built Sasha Fierce to become the entertainer that she did want. She did want this life, but she didn't know how Beyonce could do it, but Sasha Fierce could do it. Um, and, and so it disassociates, like, oh, okay, so Beyonce can, can have and still exist inside that world. Sasha Fierce lives over here, though. And so that's why so many people, when they feel like they're really embodying this alter ego concept, they feel like it's an out-of-body experience, which helps them get into the zone and the flow state because they're just so caught in the creative self. Does it happen naturally, like... Um... Like, let's just use Sasha Fierce as an example, because I think I was going to use that, right? Yeah. Because Sasha Fierce is who she is when she has when she, when she walks on stage. That's her alter ego, right? Yeah. Now, did that, on the flip side, you know, you talk about the Superman, you mm -hmm. know, and Clark, and Clark Kent, right? Superman is actually the real Beyonce, Khalil. let's say, yeah. right? And... Clark Kent is how he kind of, you know, gets along in the real world type That's of thing, right. right? So same thing, right? So is Beyonce and Clark Kent the same real world person? Like, you know, Beyonce no, I, I, is real I don't world. Think, I don't think someone needs to make that comparison. 
So Superman is Khalil. It's the superpowers that he has. He creates Clark Kent so that he can be go unnoticed in this human society and just like live amongst people. Also, um, so he's the mild mannered version of himself, and the glasses are there. And some people will will joke and say um, he really is uh, a social narrative on the writers and creators of Superman on making fun of human society. But that's not it. He, because of him living amongst human beings, he got to understand us better. So when he was defending, you know, why should we save planet Earth to the other superheroes that could come along or the enemies or villains, he's like, no, you don't understand these people. Um, but Clark Kent was a useful alter ego for him. But the real him is there. And that's why I say to people, like, I just feel like most people are walking around as Clark Kent's in their world. But really, underneath it all, there is a superwoman superhero that's there. And really what's there is a collection of attributes and traits and qualities because most people just live through a habit of self and you believe that that's who you are but you're denying the very nature of being a human being is our creative capacity to reinvent ourselves to transform that's what we're gifted with nothing else on the planet has the creative imagination of a human being nothing else that's one of our great superpowers and so Beyonce is a great example by creating Sasha Fierce and then even she said when she was retiring her in 2008 I don't need her anymore because I am that now. She, she now reconciled it within. I became that. It's like two Venn diagrams finally meeting. And even I use the quote all the time when I'm doing keynote speeches, Cary Grant, the great um, Hollywood golden era actor, like debonair, charismatic, charming, and everything. Well, he grew up in Bristol, England, um, terribly insecure about his poor upbringing with his mom. Um, but he had this desire to want to go to Hollywood. and. He talked in an interview at the end of his career how he said, I pretended to be somebody I wanted to be, and I finally became that person, or he became me, but at some point we met. So he, he didn't stay shackled to this identity that he didn't choose. Like, we don't choose where we grow up. We don't choose, you know, parents. We don't choose environment that we're, we're you know, birthed into. I got lucky. I have phenomenal parents. But many people don't have that. And it shapes a lot mm -hmm. of how they see themselves. And so I just encourage people that, you know, there's a great line in the movie Rocket Man, um, which is a phenomenal movie. I encourage everyone to watch it because it's, it's almost like a documentary on alter egos. Um, but I love John, it. And there's this meeting of a mentor that happens, this, this other great musician. And he's sitting down with Reggie at the time before he changed his name to Elton John. And he says, sometimes you've got to kill the person you were born to be to become the person you want to be. And I would just say that if I shifted it to like the language of, you know, a coach, I'd say sometimes you're shaped into becoming the person you don't want to be. And you need to kill that to become the person you want to be. And if you're someone who's ambitious and you're constantly taking on new things, starting a business, you know, um, yeah, you got to reconcile the fact that maybe who you are right now, we need to rebirth into a new role and identity so that we can go and, and win. I think, yeah, no, I like that. Um, what is then, what is considered, I mean, but you said something though I, I found interesting is that if you do it long enough, like uh, uh, Beyonce did or whoever, does it just become, is it, does it lose, do you, does it kind of get out of the alter ego-ness and it becomes just part of who you are as a whole? And if okay. you, if, yeah. if you kind of drop, like does Kobe Bryant lose Mamba, and is he is he now embodied Mamba? Is he Kobe He's embodied Mamba? Embodied the traits that he ultimately was wanting, because the purpose right. of the alter ego was to draw out of me the characteristics and traits that I want to bring to that role. Um, and going back to like the question on why it's so successful, well, you know, we were talking about visualization earlier. You know, in teaching the people that you talk to about the importance of, you know, having a vision for your life and stuff. So we say these words, you got to visualize, you have to have a vision. Um, you know, if anytime you're doing a project, it's not go build me a website. It's, hey, I like these three websites. So you give someone a picture of what your is, your, what it is you're trying to move towards. And then it's a lot easier for that web designer to create it for you, right? Because you said these three things, I like that header from that one. I like, you know, how this one's built. Mm -hmm. Well. When we're trying to change ourselves or change the way we show up in the world, the alter ego is just simply the perf is a great model that we can use to create a picture in our mind of what we're trying to move towards. 
Does that make sense? Because again, sensory center of our brain yeah. is dedicated to the visual cortex. And so if I'm trying to, quote, change myself or transform myself into what? Some people have a hard time with that. So when I come along and I say, hey, there's a reason why in my office and other, where, other places in my home, I have this magazine cover with Mr. Rogers and Daniel Tiger on it, okay? Mr. Rogers is my alter ego, along with my dad, for how I want to be as a dad. So this person that you're interviewing here is not the same version of me that I bring to my kids. I am a challenger personality in my coaching and in most interviews like this, because I want to break a lot of these really bad paradigms that are out there in the world. That's a part of my mission. But do I need to bring the challenger personality to my kids? It would be very easy for me to believe after eight, 10 hours of working every single day, flexing the muscle of being a challenger and like, you know, breaking the egos of some of the very big personalities that I'll work with, that that's me. No, it's not. It was a useful form for me to bring onto that field of play. But my kids don't need a challenger personality type. I want a kind, generous, patient, loving, and creative dad to be around them. That's the energy that I want to nurture them with. And Mr. Rogers is my mental image that I have in my mind following me around saying, okay, Todd, if you say that you're going to embody me, I'm watching you, right? Like that's, that's a part of my method that I talk about in the book is that honoring the spirit of whatever we're trying to bring into our moments. And, you know, so if Mr. Rogers and my dad were following me around and watching me and saying, okay, like you're a representation of us, Todd, let's see, let's see how well you do. So I, I mimicked in, in the beginning before my daughter Molly, who's 10, came along, I mimicked and I practiced his mannerisms. I practiced his method. Like anytime you talk to a kid, he'd get down on one knee because he wanted to get down to their level. He didn't want to lord over them. So I practiced that. There's nothing fake in that. There's, that's, that's me being very intentional about, hey, I do want to be successful as a father. I do want to bring the best of myself to them and it's me realizing that there's no one version of Todd. There's many versions of me, and I'm excited through every role I get to play in my life to experiment with these different traits and qualities that are available to me and bring them out into the light of day. And it's made me a better coach then as well because I didn't flex so, some of those traits before, and now I do have them. So then what is the trapped self? The trapped self is when a lot of the motivations for why you're showing up in the world is an outside in approach, okay? That's why mm -hmm. imposter syndrome became this ubiquitous term on social media because mm -hmm. many people are showing up trying to posture to other people to impress them to get likes and comments and shares. Um, and hey, I'd love to get as many likes, comments and shares as I possibly can, but I'm still not going to sell myself out in some way. So a trapped self is your experience in your in some role in your life, not your entire world, because you might be successful in some areas of your life, but in one area of your life, could be your professional role or mom or dad or, or whatever, you just feel like not all of you is getting out there. And so there's something that's trapping your qualities that you, you do have from getting out there. You didn't, how it shows up then, Jen, is you know, you're out with one of your girlfriends and someone says something about your girlfriend while you're there and you didn't say something in the moment. And then when you get home at night and you're laying in bed and you're like, why didn't I, she's my bestie. Like, why didn't I, and, and, and you beat yourself up because you didn't act from a true sense of what you stand for. That's an example of a trapped self that's there. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's, there's many, many right. things that can cause that trapped self from getting out there. But basically it's, you know you can do better and you're not for whatever reason. And it's hard to figure it all out for you. I, okay, I get that. Um, then, okay, so let's say for example, someone doesn't have their alter ego down, right? So they come see you and you have to develop it with them. How do, how do you help someone develop an alter ego? Great, so I'll give everyone kind of the simple five-step process with it, right? And there's always nuance in it, but step one is always <laughs> identify the one role that you're doing it for. You're not building an, an alter ego for your entire life. It's for a specific role um, in, your, in your world. So you might be struggling with um, not making sales calls like I was in my business. So I built Super Richard mm -hmm. for that. Um, I didn't need the help for coaching. I kind of felt already confident with that. But sales and marketing, I needed help with that. 
Um, or okay. it could be your challenge because you're taking on the new role of being a new mom or a new dad. Oftentimes, because I've done speeches to the actually the Los Angeles uh, YPO billionaires in the room. What, uh, I know which which YPO chapter was it? My Santa husband's Monica. in uh, the Be oh, okay, he's in the Beverly Hills chapter. Oh, okay. No. no um, yeah. You'd be. I was actually thinking this whole time. God, they should be hiring at YPO. You'd be a great talk for them. Yeah. So I've done a bunch of YPO yeah. events, and but anyways, I've I've talked about this, and so many people come to me like, hey, you had me. And then when you brought up Mr. Rogers and you, you're like, oh, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, where, I was not expecting that. <laughs> that's where I under index in my life is being a, a parent or something like that. So, anyway. but, but by the way, I'm happy you use that as an example, right? Because I think that it brings, it, it you it, you show the uh, variances, right? Like it's not just for business. Like no. power. I mean, you could have an alter ego for any area of your life that you want to show up differently. Yeah. It could be for parenting. It could be for your businesses. It could be for your personal relationships as a wife, a mother, whatever. So I love that you actually did use that as an example because it makes people think about it in a bigger, broader, in a broader way. Yeah, yeah, because it's so easy because we think about okay, I'm going to make more money or I'm going to achieve this, and it's like, listen, your right. greatest achievement. I mean, as a parent, your greatest achievement is always going to be your kids. I mean, that's just my that's my belief anyway. 100 percent well you're canadian of course you're going to think that yeah, sure. you're, you're solid your values are so solid i mean and i can hear the canadian in you by the way sorry and about sorry, and yeah, you eh? sound like uh, me good times, <laughs> eh? i couple, feel like i'm home get a couple of beers in you and it doesn't take long for it to come out eh? um yeah exactly so, <laughs> exactly so always stick it. to which one role one identity that you're trying to, to do this for okay and then secondly it's well what is it about the way that you're showing up or not showing up that is getting in the way of you achieving what it is that you want there. So it's like going back to like myself um, and Super Richard, I was indecisive, so I wasn't taking action. I was insecure, I didn't have confidence. And because I was worried about rejection and resistance of making these phone calls to try and book a speaking gig or a workshop. And then the third one was I wasn't very articulate, like I was an absolute word salad of like, oh, well, I can do this, and I, like, right? Like, that never works. You know this from good messaging. <laughs> salad. Yeah. Yeah, um, hilarious. And so I knew what was getting in the way. So there's typically ways, traits, attributes, qualities, characteristics that you're bringing to this identity, this role that you've got, that are counter to you reaching your success. Well, then that gets to the third step, which is, okay, well, then what are the superpowers that you want? Every alter ego or every superhero has, you know, characteristics, traits, abilities. So for me, it was I wanted to be more confident. I wanted to be decisive. I didn't want to end every day beating myself up again for not doing the things I said I was going to do that day. I didn't make the calls I said right. I was going to do the night before. Everyone's super motivated the night before, right? But then when you get to the edge of the field and you got to step onto it, that's when people go back to the locker room so many times in their day. So what parts of that role that you have in your life are you turning away from and not doing the actions well what are the traits that you want well i wanted to be more confident decisive and articulate which were the flips of the things that were holding me back and immediately i knew for me that was the kind of composite of which is now step four well who could be the source of inspiration for it what's the source code and it was uh benjamin franklin superman and joseph campbell Benjamin Franklin, because I wanted his confidence. The man had seven phenomenal careers in his life. He is the model of reinvention like nobody else. Superman, man of action, that was his tagline, right? Like he was decisive. And then Joseph Campbell, who wrote The Power of Myth and the Hero's Journey, and he was just so articulate. And I sort of fell in love with him when I was about 12, watching him do a PBS special. And so I wanted their qualities and attributes. And then I created the name. And it's important to have a name for this because ideas that float around in our mind without giving them form and substance, they're ethereal. They don't have any weight to them. But the moment you give something a name and the, the fact that we give a, a picture, right, moving towards Joseph Campbell and Benjamin Franklin and, and Superman with a name, that is like, now, it's, now it feels real. And so Super Richard was the name. Richard is my actual first name. And because I was 21 and insecure, I was like, oh, Todd sounds like I'm 12. And Richard just sounds more businessy. And I was using super because it was the first part of Superman. So Super Richard became my name. Now, I didn't go 
Jen and call people and say, hey, this is Super Richard calling. Can I book it? No, it was the state <laughs> of, it was my state of mind that I was in. And then the fifth step is, and this goes back to like the science of why this is so effective. It's because we're leveraging already existing scientific rules that happen inside of the human mind. I talked about enclosed cognition before. Have a uniform, a totem, or an artifact that you use to step into this identity. So I went out and I bought a pair of non-prescription gla glasses at Lens Crafters in West Edmonton Mall, which was the largest mall in the world at the time. And that was when wearing glasses was not cool. Like everyone was getting LASIK, you know, you don't wear glasses anymore, nerds wear glasses, blah, blah, blah. But I went out and I bought a pair of non-prescription glasses because I wanted to do the reverse Superman. He put on the glasses to become Clark Kent. I was putting on my cape. And I would practice embodying this confidence and this decisiveness and this um, uh, articulation that I was going to have. And then I would, well, well, how would I move? What would I, like it, embodying it? Like, what does it mean to be these people? Like, you know, and I would ask myself different questions. Like, if I actually was Benjamin Franklin, would he really, would he really care about just calling and asking someone to book a workshop? Like, is that going to be the, the hill that he dies on as a human being? No, that's silly, right? And so that was, right. that's kind of the basics of the five steps of kind of how you adopt this. And when you actually unwind and you, you look at how a lot of other people built their alter egos, Winston Churchill, Martin Luther King, I talk about him in the book, um, you know, Kobe, even though I built it, but it's the same method, Sasha Fierce. There was a moment that they were challenged with something, a circumstance, a situation, a new thing that they wanted to birth into the world. And they had a hard time seeing themselves do it and voila, they tapped into their creative imagination and built something new. I love it. Who are the other, some of the other people that you will talk about that you helped? So like beyond, Rafa on the Dow, of course, Kobe. Um, yeah, as, a, as an example, so Rafa. Um, That's a huge one. Yeah. And you also <laughs> said Cristiano Ronaldo. Yeah, so well, they're the ones that, you know, Real Madrid was the one who ultimately bought the peak athlete. So I was able to work with yeah. all of the players um, on that team. And, and again, alter egos, gang. What is, what, hold on, what is his alter ego? What is Ronaldo's alter ego? So he doesn't really have one. He has what I call a super ego. He, I didn't need to go in and build out an alter ego for <laughs> Cristiano. He's got, he has a super ego. And there's a bunch of other athletes that are very, very similar that have extraordinary, um, they basically, it's almost like God complexes that they have out on the, out on the, uh, the court, the ice, the field, whatever the case is. So, you know, again, this is just one of the tools that I had to help anyone develop and, and get towards their goal, but not everyone did I build out an alter ego for, um, cause there was, no, no, but this is your, but yeah. that's, but, the, but that is what, that is one of your main yeah. things that Absolutely. you kind of, that's one of your big modalities is like the alter ego is your thing. Yeah. So like people who have a super ego, like Cristiano Chris, uh, Ronaldo, or who's the other one, Nadal, did you see he had a super ego too, no, or you built didn't. an he, alter? His, his was the alter ego was needed. And, and he spends about five minutes um, before going onto the court, stepping into that identity. And everyone leaves the room and he spends his time like, you know, drawing forth that guy that needs to go out there because Rafa is one of the nicest people that there is that walks this planet. But when you're going to go out and compete at the highest levels, the one thing that can get in the way of that is this kindness trait, is this fairness trait and stuff. And so in the book, I kind of talk, I talk about a tennis player that I worked with, um, a woman who was known to be, should be winning more major championships. And yet she would dominate in the early set. And then she would take her foot off the gas because she would feel bad about it. And then she would let that person come back in to the match. And it creates something that's very dangerous in sport, momentum. And momentum creates, going back to you're asking about confidence. How do I create confidence, people? Momentum. That's how you do it. Because if, if I can stack a bunch of wins for 14 days, 21 days straight. Boy, does that ever start um, a, a boulder, uh, a snowball going down a hill that is hard to compare. So it's how do you build confidence? Reps, doing it over and over again. All of a sudden, you start to see yourself differently. You've got discipline. Wait, a, wait, wait, I've got discipline. I've got consistency. Putting those two together, momentum, 
And then momentum begets confidence. And fundamentally, what I'm try trying to get to with everybody is certainty, because certainty is trust. And so when an athlete is out there playing against Rafa, and Rafa feels bad because he's beaten someone so badly, and he takes his foot off the gas, and that person starts to get momentum, and then they get confidence. And if they get confidence enough that they're certain that they can beat Rafa, now the entire playing field is leveled. There is no advantage for Rafa or insert the name of anyone else, because in that moment in time, that player feels like they can beat. And so that certainty is important because it creates trust then. I trust myself, I trust my abilities, I can get into the flow state, I can get into the zone. So that's the kind of algorithm that I'm thinking about when working with people. That's great, that's amazing. So then what is his, alpha, what is his alter ego? What is his, you said he has a five minute process before he gets on, what is it, what does yeah. he do? So his is private to him, so that one, that one I wouldn't oh, share. Okay. Um, you know, Kobe was one of the few, but he actually built it into a friggin' brand for himself, which is, yeah, I, I take no zero kidding. credit for that. That is 100% Kobe, um, and yeah, he's a master, truly it was. But yeah, can so- you, Can you, can Go ahead. Oh no, go ahead, finish what you're gonna say. Yeah, so I was just gonna say like, so um, that's the one thing with, for anyone that's listening and you're, you know, kind of wrestling with this idea for yourself is, we don't have to go out and broadcast to everyone that we have this alter ego. It, it's, it is a private mental game strategy that you use to help you to be more playful because playfulness is that final golden key that unlocks capability, flow state, the zone. You know, because if you're going to take everything so rigidly and seriously, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to get into the flow state if you're serious because it's activating too much of your um, frontal lobe area anyway, reasoning and judgment. and so uh, there's, there's a playfulness that's here because there's, it's, it's at the seat of creative imagination. But it is, it's this golden key that unlocks flow state for people. But you don't have to tell everyone about it. It's just, I didn't tell everyone about Super Richard. It was just, it was my thing. <laughs> no, I totally agree. But just finish with the super ego part. So yeah. what, is, what does that mean? So there are people out there, like we were saying, that just have such like ingrained innate confidence that they don't need to have an alter ego to win yeah or that's right they they have so the super ego is where it, it kind of starts to couple itself with god complex where you literally feel at your core that you are not of this world you're born differently than other people um you were gifted with something that no matter how hard someone else trains, they'll never be able to get to your level because you're personally tapping into something that they could never have anyway because you're a god amongst men. And that could sound very toxic to many people. But for me, being someone who's been playing around between the six inches of people's ears, that's why when I hear people talk about mental toughness and finding success, I'm like, you guys are missing so many things. Because my clients would never tell you when they're at the press conference how they actually think, how they get themselves ready for the game. Kobe would never tell people. He only did it in an interview late in his, just before he actually passed away, where he talked about getting into the cage with the mamba and the music that he would listen to, which we talked about, him and I. Um, because everyone's going to think that you're crazy. But the reality is it's what elite human beings do. They, they're, they're using different narratives and stories and rituals in their own mind that you know, other people who aren't getting the results they want in life, are, they're too, bur too busy worrying about getting my morning routine right and you know, like nourishing <laughs> myself and self-care. And you know, there's a huge softening of society that's happened in the last you know, two decades. And um, yeah, people are becoming fundamentally a lot weaker. I just saw a whole thing on this actually. Oh, you know, Dana White did this whole thing about like what, what our generation is now mm -hmm. versus how it was. And that the people from be, who are, you know, people from 20 years ago, maybe double in age, but they'll crush anybody from today because yeah. we're, we're, our society are just, basically we're just raising a bunch of Wimps, basically. It's yeah, like, but I, I'm here's, saying, a here's, nice, here's I'm saying it in a nice here's way. Here's my problem with the whole um, generational arguments that people make is, I'm like, hey, don't forget, it's the Gen Xers, like our generation and baby boomers mm -hmm. that are raising people, right? And so like- Totally you know, agree. You know, and people totally go, agree. ha, 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 our generation's better than your generation. And I'm like, 
I want the next generation to be better than me because that's literally how society grows. I want one hundred percent. Also, our kids are in this generation. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. But, but 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 that doesn't mean that everybody should deserve a trophy. No. Like it's not a you know if you lose there are winners and there are losers and you have to you have to try to teach you know at a younger age. Yeah. At some point, some grit and some and, and like that there you have to work hard and work ethic and that's my opinion. So so to your point. Um, my, my daughter Molly just finished up a baseball tournament and she got a medal. They didn't have like first places and things like that, even though they did finish first place. Um, but she's 10. It's not about first places. It's about developing the skills at this point in time. Mm -hmm. And so she got a medal and she, so she, they did the ceremony and she went back to the person and handed it back and said, no, I don't need this. And because we talk about we, we don't accept participation ribbons. You don't need that. You don't need that, Molly, to, to make yourself feel good about how you're developing yourself because it's an internal thing. I don't want you to have to have that thing as an object to show that you participated. Yeah. I can only imagine you as a dad, but then you have that Mr. Rogers thing. So like, I would think you'd be great as a performance coach for these young, like these youngsters, like your kids. Well, that's Do where they... I started. That's where I started was there. I don't, and it's still, you know, the great joy of my career is, was working with the 12 year olds, the 13 year olds. But not as a Mr. Rogers, if not no. when you're Mr. Rogers. But I was, I was a very different coach back then. I wasn't as much of a challenger. I was very sort of nurturing as a coach you know, with them. And it's, and it's why I was very successful with that age group. And so anytime I do, because I still, um, five young people every year get to apply to work with me for free for the year. Um, so you have to be under the age how of- How young? Oh. oh, well, I mean, you said, how come? And I said, how young? Because oh, yeah. I was going to apply. Yeah. So you have to be below <laughs> the age of 18. You have to be playing sport. Um, you have to be um, in the upper echelon of your sport as well. There has to be a chance and a shot, you know, and you got to have aspirations to move up in your sport. And you have to write a, uh, a five-page essay on you know why you would be a good fit and why you want to work with me, and and then I'll mentor you all year long for free. And what is that like when someone works with you? Like if I hired you one on one, yeah. How does it work? Do I hire you for? I mean, I know you're not seventy-five dollars for three days anymore, yeah. but like, um, how do I do? I do it like it's an app. Like, do I buy ten sessions? And I'm and I'm asking for my like seriously like. Yeah. Do I buy? Do I buy a, 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 a ten sessions? Do I buy for the year? How do you work? Like, what is your whole it, like? What it's, is so? A, I have coaching and mentoring programs like group stuff that lots of people can come into that are entrepreneurial. Um, okay. And then because you sold your company right to the real majority, yeah, real. But I have okay. a, But I have another another company. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the. So for 90 day year, which is focused on entrepreneurs, so we have coaching mentoring programs that are there and they're either 90 day or a year long. And I, it's not just one on one with me. That's me and my head of coaching and other people. But if someone was working with me one on one, there's different options. There's people who come in and they it's a they want the entire full meal deal of like, I want you to because I do a ton of like business coaching and mentoring. So like actually on building your business model, it's kind of one of my other superpowers is that so it's um, in that one, it's a year long, and we would typically meet at least once every two weeks, but there's a lot of asynchronous coaching going on in between. Typically the ones who get the best results, you know, send me audio messages or text messages frequently throughout the week. Um, and, but we always kick off every single quarter with um, a three hour to four hour session together. What happened? So again, where did you come from? What's, what's happening? What do we need to move forward? Um, and then we're, I, I look at it as it's three circles of a Venn diagram. I'm working with you on your inner game. I'm working with you on your strategy game and then the execution game. So like doing what we what do we actually need to do? Execute what are the routines, the habits for you, the business, whatever the inner game, getting you very clear on who is showing up. How are you showing up? Um, what are the attitudes that we need in order to win? And then the strategy side of things is, um, really coming up with your custom approach that's going to be right for you and your world that you have. Um, like Brene Brown's team came to me um, with a similar thing because of just my experience of scaling coaching and training companies. They wanted, when they were building out their certification, help with that. Um, but there is another opportunity where people can buy a rack rate of hours off of me. And I, they can just 
you know, use them up whenever they want. It just has to be used up within the first year. Like how much are how much are you? So to buy eight hours from me, um, that's the rack of hours that people could buy. It's twenty thousand dollars for eight hours. And then for that year thing that you're talking about, how much is it? So for the full meal deal, it's gonna it's gonna start at six figures and and go up depending on frequency and and how often we how many sessions basically people want to have throughout that time together. But I don't really sell sessions because I'm like you know the value that we deliver. It's it's like anything. It's value based pricing. I mean I'm a as the people who work with me because I don't bring on people who are making like you know six figures. I'm not I'm not the right person for that. It would it would be silly to use your money that way, but the value that I want to make an impact for someone is in the millions for how they how they run things. What CEOs do you work with? Can you talk about that? Yeah, so um, I mean, so John Chambers, the CEO of Cisco Systems, and coming in and working with uh, them. Um, uh, Bruce Richards, who's a PE guy out of uh, New York City, a billionaire. Um, him and his company. Um, CEO uh, Cole Gordon, another example. So he's in the sales training space and um, he came in, was doing about, I think, four and a half million dollars a year a couple of years ago. And we have his coaching and training company up to 42 million um, now. So, like, it runs the gamut of different types of CEOs. I typically like working with people who are below a quarter of a billion dollars um, in business because the CEO or the entrepreneur or the leader of it is still very much connected to a lot of parts of the business and we can make a really a, a larger impact. I don't work as much anymore with people that are CEOs of, you know, multinational big corporations. Is the 20,000 Canadian dollars or is it American? <laughs> in, in New York City. I got to pay my New York City taxes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, and how many people, how big is your business? Like how many people do you have working for you now? So, uh, so I have a couple of, I, I have a software company called UpCoach and UpCoach is a platform to help coaches um, build out their coaching and training kind of empire because um, that's always the that's typically the hardest part is the delivery side of a coaching company. So I started that a couple mm -hmm. of years ago with two co-founders um, in Turkey. And, and then my, my, my personal company with like 90 a year alter ego world, we have a total of eight people basically full time in it. And then, you know, we try to keep things as lean as we possibly can. And so then there's probably another 15 to 20 people that we contract. Uh, different things for and i feel like my god poor you it's been like two hours and i'm i'm, I'm just going and you're like standing <laughs> don't you want to take a seat for, for for i mean like you've been standing for two hours already no i'm i'm good I'm are good. you okay yeah i'm great okay well I, I will wrap it i did have one other question though but i don't remember what it is now but um i, I just find this i'm like i'm i'm Jen, so we're fascinated not, we're, we, by been, this I, I knew that we were gonna i knew that we were gonna be buddies um, the moment that <laughs> I, I do actually, frankly, the moment that Melanie, cause I really, Melanie is responsible for one of the great wins of my life. And, um, so Melanie does not do a lot of connections very often, but when she does, she always introduces me to like superstar people. So, um, yeah. That is really sweet. I mean, yeah, no, I, I, I'm really loving you right now. Like, I love all the, everything you said. I love the way your approach. I love the honesty, the fact that you're so blunt, you're not mincing any words. You're not trying to, you know, like, you're not, I just think that I think you're fantastic. I really wow. do. I have all, like, I, 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 no, no. I mean, are you going to be in LA anytime soon? I would love to even do like a part two in yeah. person. Would yeah. You? I mean, yeah. Oh, absolutely. So, um, I have a bunch of travel that's upcoming, and I think I'm going to be in LA in four weeks, something like that. But oh my gosh, I didn't know that. Well, I mean, because especially when I come out to to Kelowna, I'll typically try to come down to um, uh, Los Angeles quite a bit because I just have a, like lots of friends down there. I do lots of business down there as well. So um, I was, I mean, I was just there a couple of weeks or a few weeks ago. So. Wow. Okay. So wait, so then I'm going to wrap this. I, if I have, I can't remember the, I had two questions in my brain and I can't remember. Oh, I do. Uh, habits. Cause this is my podcast. Yeah. Are there specific habits uh, and rituals that you do tell your clients at that level that are like non-negotiable that are mandatory to kind of keep their, you know, productivity and brain, right? Yeah. Great question. So, um, Actually, I'll give you a pop quiz here, Jen. Uh, put you on the spot. Do you know what the Do number it. one cause yep. 
of weight gain is. Nothing beats it. Uh, lack of sleep or Nailed bad it. nutrition? Sleep. Sleep is yeah. something that you cannot outrun. And so if there was a non-negotiable to help people, um, it's exactly what helped Cristiano Ronaldo. So Cristiano, when we did the diagnostic with him, wasn't getting enough sleep. The average athlete needs to get at least 10 and a half hours of sleep and deep rest a day. Their bodies go through so much physical breakdown. You know this as a fitness superstar, like the, bo the, the body <laughs> rebuilds itself in sleep mode. And so, um, so sleep is the non-negotiable. And so if you wanna operate at a really extraordinarily high level, we need to be taking care of that. Having said that though, there are a class of us who don't need a lot of sleep. So I have a certain genetic marker inside of my DNA where I can operate at a high level. It doesn't cause me any sort of negative um, uh, biological issues. I can operate at a high level with about four and a half hours of sleep a day. Um, John Gruden, the head coach of the um, former head coach, he was the exact same way. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually what it, it was, it was kind of part of my um let's say secret code for how i was able to do so much more work than other people well i didn't need as much sleep as everyone else did but that's really rare so you know when we're talking about sleep monitoring that's the biggest habit that we want to get into is what is the what is the consistent time that we get you into bed okay um, anything else and then the well i mean it's it's anything that's going to be feeding their um you know I, uh, even though I'm an inner game guy, one of the last places I want to make a problem for you, Jen, is your six inches between your ears, right? Like a belief issue. <laughs> Not everything in life is a belief <laughs> issue. So um, another one is, you know, just classic water intake um, stuff. Um, oh, you know, so this, basic. This, You're talking, yeah. This is yeah. this is boring to people, but it really is. Not to my people, because this is what we this is what we love. Yeah. Habits, rituals, what keeps you on point. This so is exactly what we talk about. Just table stakes stuff, stuff that sits at the very bottom of Maslow's hierarchy and needs. You know, that's the way to be thinking about it. The place for your habits that are going to give you the greatest impact is going to be something that impacts you down there. People talk about journaling. Journaling is um, a self-transcendence thing. It's a self-esteem need. Um, whether or not my clients do it or don't do it, one of my most successful clients um, of all time has never journaled a day in his life, doesn't need it. Um, but the table stake stuff, food, shelter, clothing, water, you know, like that's where we look at good, good systems to put into place for your habits. Um, mm -hmm. Because on the days, because there's a lot of days that don't go your way, but if you're literally taking care of your biology, that can help you so much more so that your psychology doesn't get fudged up because your biology is taken care of. I'll give you another one. Um, and this goes back to the issues that I have with the personal development, self-help, leadership, or spiritual space. To the person that's listening that is struggling right now with um, clarity in their life, having a vision for things, um, being challenged with like, um, procrastination possibly, avoidant behavior. Just be mindful of the fact that there is um, a system in your body that mimics depression and depressive state that has nothing to do with your psychology. If you have a high level of yeast in your gut health, it actually mimics depression. It causes brain fog and fatigue issues. It can cause people to feel like they're procrastinating on things. But it's not because you're a procrastinator. It's literally because you've got bad gut health issues. And I say this because there's a lot of people out there who hear from insert name of like big name expert that they need another mm -hmm. goal setting uh, workshop. They need to come to another big live event. They need to read another self-help book. No, you actually might have gut health issues. It might be something as simple as that. And I, I believe you because I, I bet you you've, know, you've seen that with the people you've worked with. They probably did all this testing and then they found that was the problem. Tons of data yeah. on it, tons of data on it. Plus, it's not just me saying it. This is literally no, widely no, no. known inside of the, you know, um, the biology, oh, no, I've, nutrition world. I, yeah, I've had a ton of uh, doctors, functional medicine doctors, tell me, talk about that, gut health doc specialists, all that. But I, I'm saying you've probably seen it firsthand mm -hmm. with people that you've worked with where it's like they thought something was wrong and maybe they had that was the problem. Yeah, 
and it wasn't. It wasn't. I mean, um, even for myself, it happened to me once as well, where I was going through. I didn't realize I was going through a really bad gut health experience, but I couldn't get a clear thought through this fog in my head, no matter how hard I leveraged every other tool that I had at my disposal, and did the whole gut health stuff. Found a massive amount of yeast, got that cleared up. And within the eighth day of being on, it was called the Walls diet. So Walls, W-A-H-L. It's a diet that's specifically for people that have MS. And so mm. I've got a bit of a condition that's kind of mimics MS. And oh. I was, <laughs> my brain was so clear on the eighth day. I said to my wife, I'm like, this feels like an unfair advantage. Like, wait, that my diet and nutrition, and again, I've been living in this world for a long time, that it affects it that much. Wow. And I discovered that out of all the foods that I could eat, the one that affects my brain, any brain fog I could get is uh, starches. It's not gluten. It's not anything like that. It's starches, potatoes. Potatoes cause me more brain fog issues than anything else I could eat. Was that just through a plain blood test that you figured that out? Well, so I did a bunch of uh, blood markers, but it was literally doing the actual foods itself. So there, it's a huge elimination diet. You can only eat meat and green leafy vegetables no spices, no sugars, um, no uh, cheeses and dairy, no bread, no caffeine, so no coffee, and on and on. Like, it's pretty limiting. And, and then you start introducing these things back in and seeing how you respond. Well, bread came back, no, no issues. Dairy came back, no issues. Can't have an excessive amount of it, but I can have a little bit of cheese. Mm -hmm. But it was when I brought back starches that immediately, it was like my brain had a fog drop into it immediately. Wow, yeah, I know I've heard that before. It's really crazy, actually, that um, there's a huge uh, well, gut brain uh, connection, right? Yep. That's the gut is your second brain. Um, okay, so I'm going to wrap this up because God knows it's been forever. Um, and where could people find more information about you, Todd Herman? So uh, ToddHerman.me is my home base on the interwebs. <laughs> um, and this uh, is the book, by the way. Yeah, the alter the ego alter effect. Ego. Go get it, tag me, um, ask me questions. I respond to everybody that I get DMs every single day. Um, and then, you know, so Todd underscore Herman. So tag us in, you know, Instagram or Twitter or LinkedIn and let us know favorite takeaway. You, absolutely. This is a great book. I think I believe in this wholeheartedly. I put it in my book, Bigger, Better, Bolder. And um, I am just so thankful that I finally met you. This was really great. Start of a new friendship, that's what I'm saying. I, I'm, I'm serious. It. I'm calling it. I'm, it's, it's, it's done, like you are my friend yeah. now. I mean, like everyone go buy his book. I'm telling you, you won't be disappointed. And if you feel that you're lacking in some area that you really need to show up, this book will help you, I promise. And all the reviews, by the way, even on Amazon, speak for itself, so. Thank you, Jen. You're welcome. Don't hang up, but I'm going to say goodbye. So bye. See you.